Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant and taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he'd come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you for sitting here in such peace and security. Thank you for the way in which you use broken people to restore your perfect kingdom. Father, thank you for the perfect king who established, will return and rule that kingdom forever. Thank you for Jesus. Father, as we spend some time in history this morning, please remind us of your work in every moment. Father, shine a light on our lives through the work of your people in other generations and bring us to know you more deeply through Christ alone. Amen. There's an outline there in the service sheet. Open it up uh, there on the left-hand side. God willing, there'll be a time for questions. But let's just play a word association game when we begin. If I say to you, John Calvin, what do you think? That's good. I can hear it all ticking. Some people might just have a blank there. I've never heard of the bloke. Some people might think, are you going to talk about Hobbes as well? But I'm not. Some people might think of a lawyer. Some people might think of a control freak. Some people might think of predestination and that great theology called Calvinism. Some people might think of a theocracy where God's rule is the town law. Some of those who even know their church history might think, let's burn a heretic at the stake today. When you play word association with Calvin, it's not often positive, especially in the wider world. But it does raise a question for us. Do we actually know this bloke? Do we actually know what makes him tick? Do we actually understand one of those great figures from church history who was sinful just like us and the way God used him? Well, we're going to spend a bit of time with Calvin today because in the church calendar today is Reformation Sunday. Today when we remember a great historical event called the Reformation, it was a moment in history in Western Europe where God used frail, fallible men and women who are sinners like us to rediscover the great truths of Jesus Christ in the Bible. That sinful humans are saved by God's grace alone because of Christ alone received by faith alone, revealed in the scriptures alone, all to the glory of God alone. It was a historical moment when the truth of the good news of Jesus' life, death and resurrection were rediscovered where people like us could read the Bible in our own language. Do you, do you realise that until the Reformation you would not be able to open your Bible and read English? You would not be able to read it in the language of Woolies? Uh, it was a historical moment when salvation and forgiveness of sins by God's grace in Christ was received by faith. It was a historical moment where people realised in God's word anyone could be saved, from the ploughman to the aristocrat, from the milkmaid through to the majesty. It was a moment when all of those great truths were restored to God's people and the world. It was started by accident, like most great movements are, when a German monk called Martin Luther decided to have an argument. 1517, he nailed 95 theses on the church door in his hometown. I don't think he realised what a bonfire he was setting off. But at that exact moment, there were a whole lot of historical events going on. There was social media. There'd never been social media until that day. But suddenly the printing press was invented. And you could churn out documents and everyone could read them because education had increased and ideas spread rapidly. 
It was the first moment in history when nationality said we want our independence and be our own country. That had never happened before. And it was a moment in history where everyone was petrified about dying where everyone lacked assurance about what would happen after death. And so all of these things came together and God used very normal, fallible, sinful men and women like us to change the world, to return his people to the good news of Jesus. Now one of those men was John Calvin. Uh, We're going to quickly go through his I'm at point two on the outline. If you want a copy of this timeline I'm going to give you, uh, you can grab me later on and I can run them off or send them out. It was going to be on the slide, but you're just going to have to imagine it. And I had some really funky maps. But let me tell you, do you know where France is? That's where he was born, 1509. Born in France in 1523. So how old is he? 14. His parents sent him to Paris to study divinity. His father organised a number of churches to support him. By 1528, he had his master's degree. So how old is he? 19. Master's degree in divinity, and he decides to move to study law. At that point, Calvin's swimming in a world that is radically changing. And the thing that's changing is something called humanism. It's the emphasis on getting back to the original race. So people are opening the Bible and actually reading it in Hebrew and Greek. Uh, As they do, they're discovering that actually God's saying this, but we've been told this. And if you know your dates, Calvin is now starting to read stuff written by Luther, who's gone ahead of him. Calvin's second generation Reformation. By 1532... So by the time he's 23, he's received his doctorate in civil law. I've wasted my life. 1532 to 1534, he's converted. He's one of the few reformers where we don't have a conversion account. He reflects on what happened to him, and one of the things that emerges is he realised that God had softened his heart, that God had softened his heart. It's unclear whether Calvin's ever ordained as a minister or ever ordained into the priesthood. But in 1533, in November, something significant happens in Paris. At the university where Calvin was studying, the rector, kind of like the theological leader or chaplain of the university, stood up on All Saints Day and preached a sermon that blew up France. His name was Nicholas Kopp. It's called the Kopp Affair. And then he stood up, he confronted the church of the day and said, we must reform. Have you heard of Luther? Well, the king of France was quite cranky and pronounced a death sentence on Nicholas Kopp. The problem with that was he actually didn't write the speech. Calvin did. And so Calvin had to flee with Kopp. That sounds better than Calvin and Hobbes, doesn't it? Calvin and Kopp. 1536, he's on the run. He's aiming for Strasbourg. He's left France and he writes his first copy of a book that will change the course of Christian history, the Institutes of Christian Religion. It's now 1,500 pages, but when he first wrote it, it was less than 30. And he writes this book to the King of France because the King of France is killing people who hold on to Luther especially a social class called the Huguenots. A number of massive massacres happen throughout France as people who hold on to these truths that have been rediscovered get slaughtered. And Calvin writes to the king of France and pleads for mercy. At the same time, Geneva, a city-state in Switzerland, has decided to follow Luther. And so they're changing, they're reforming, they're thinking through these truths. On his way to Strasbourg, Calvin gets to Geneva and books into a motel and it changes his life. Late in the evening, there's a knock on the door and when he opens the door, the man there, William Farrell, shirt fronts him. He grabs him and he says, God has brought you to Geneva For his will, if you leave, you are under eternal condemnation. 
You'd rethink your motel booking, wouldn't you? But Calvin has a tender conscience and he stays. And he helps start the Reformation of Geneva. In 1538, he's expelled because like every headstrong young man who's a lawyer, he did not bend and he was inflexible. And so the town council kick him and Farrell out. 1538 to 1541, he finally gets to Strasbourg. He stays there and he describes it as the very happiest three years of his life. He's influenced by a man called Martin Bucer, who is temperate and wise and godly. Uh, In these years, he marries a widow called Idolette in 1540. He had pastored Idolette and her husband as her husband died of cancer. They marry. She brings her son and daughter into the marriage. They themselves have three children who all die under the age of three. She herself dies in 1549. In 1541... In those happy period in Strasbourg, the elders in Geneva send a message to Calvin and say, please come back and help us. And so Calvin accepts the invitation. He begins the reform of the city, which is not really bedded down until 1555. In those 14 years, it is a time of absolute chaos in Geneva. And Calvin is hated to the point where the most popular dog name in Geneva was Calvin. 1559, he begins the Geneva Academy. It's established to educate the more than 7,000 religious refugees who flock there because they fear for their lives back home and they know that Geneva is a haven of peace. Out of that academy comes the University of Geneva, which is still running today. All of those 7,000 religious refugees were sent home, trained, equipped as missionaries. John Knox was one of them, back to Scotland, and Presbyterianism was established. 1564, Calvin dies. Not a long life, is it? 55 years? (laughs) Achieved a bit, didn't he? Throughout his life, he suffered significant ill health. He was sick so often. So sick often that he ended up deciding that he would eat only once a day in order to settle what was going on inside him. By the time the reform was bedded down in Geneva, Calvin was preaching 10 to 15 times a week, each a unique sermon, each prepared from the Greek or the Hebrew, each written by quill under candlelight. It's a decent work ethic, isn't it? So what makes a bloke like him tick? (laughs) I'm at point three on the airline. What drives a bloke like Calvin? Was he driven because of some lack of self-esteem and a desire to conquer the world? Was Was he driven because he was a control freak who wanted to control everything in front of him? What actually drove him? It's a good question to ask about historical figures, isn't it? Because once we ask it about them, who have we got to ask it of? We've got to ask it about ourselves, don't we? And one of the great things about history is that when we look at great men and women, even children from other generations in God's people, their lives shine a spotlight on our lives. And we can think about what we're doing. And so I'm going to use the two passages that we've read very quickly to look at what made Calvin tick and what made Calvin work. Uh, When I'm doing this, I'm really helped by a John Piper book which is called 21 Servants of Sovereign Joy. 21 Servants of Sovereign Joy. It is sensational. If you don't like reading it, listen to the sermons that are its foundation. And the sermons are online under Songs of the Swan. But it is superb. So what what made Calvin tick? What drove him? Well, let's turn to Philippians 2. If you've got your Bibles there, page 1041, have it open because I'm going to try and use Calvin's preaching method to work our way through it. Philippians is written by Paul to God's mob in Philippi. Philippi is a Roman colony established by ex-Roman soldiers who, as they leave the army, are given a plot of land. It's a beachhead of the empire. And so in that city, the question of citizenship is crucial. 
Which kingdom do you belong to? Philippians 3 verse 20. And so as he writes this section that I read a little earlier, Paul wants to capture the mindset of the citizens of the kingdom of God. And the mindset expresses a community that is humble and serving. But do you notice where the mindset comes from in verse 5? Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. It's the mind of Christ that is the mindset of the people of God. It seems most likely that Paul took a little section of an early hymn or creed and it's a part that does a lot of moving, literally and figuratively. Jesus is fully God. Do you see that there in verse 6? He existed in the form of God. But how did Jesus express his godness? Did he use it for his advantage? Did he reach out to take more power? Was he ambitious? Did he want the father's job? No, no, look there. Jesus expresses his godness by emptying himself. Verse 7, by taking on the form of a slave or a servant. That expression of his godness is the incarnation. We talked about that in the Athanasian Creed, didn't we? Where he took on flesh and became fully human like one of us. He came, look there in verse 7, as a man. And as he humbled himself that way, he humbled himself even further. Do you see that there in verse 8? He became obedient. He expressed his godness as God the Son by obeying God the Father and he died. Not just any death, not a peaceful death in his sleep with no pain. It was even to death on a cross. It was a death of exclusion, rejection, a death of injustice (coughs) and criminality. It was a death of extreme humility, publicly exhibited in front of those you had made from the dust. That's how Jesus shows his God. That's how Jesus expresses his godness. For this reason, verse 9, you see that there? There is an explanation. For this reason, what did God do? God highly exalted him. God highly exalted. Now, I think there's a lot going on in that word exalted there. I think it's at least the resurrection, isn't it? He brought him out of the tomb. He lifted him up from the grave. But more than that, he highly exalted him and gave him something. Verse 9, gave him a name, a name that transforms the world. When that name is spoken, it echoes throughout all the universe. Up high, here, and underneath. And when that name is spoken, what happens to every knee? It bows. What happens to every tongue? It confesses that Jesus Christ is his, the name. Jesus Christ is Lord. There is nothing outside his power, authority, dominion, concern, or rule in all of the way world. That's how Jesus expressed his godness. Now, when he did that, why did he do it? Look back through that song. Is there any mention of the forgiveness of sins? Any mention of the salvation of souls? Any mention that Jesus is your substitution or your sacrifice? They're remarkable absences from a song about Jesus, aren't they? They're remarkably absent from this summary of the mind of Christ. They're quite confronting for us. Quite confronting for us who've grown up on the truth that the reason Jesus came, lived, died and rose is because of me and my sins. None of them are mentioned. So why does Paul summarise the mind of Christ this way? Why does he talk about Jesus expressing his godness this way? It's there in the last clause, isn't it? 
Why does Jesus do all of this? To the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. Why did Jesus take on flesh and express his godness in a humiliating death? Why was Jesus resurrected and given a name above every name? Why is Jesus given the job of Lord of the universe? So all of the universe might know God's glory. The glory of God. Oh, what's the glory of God? Oh, the glory of God is his heaviness, his bigness, his weightiness, his pay attention to meanness. A really simple illustration I've used a number of times is uh, when I drive to Moree, I don't worry about the bloke on the posty bike. I worry about the B-double. That's the most significant thing on the road. Who's the most significant one in the universe? It's God. That's his glory. God is the most significant. And the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is for the revelation of that truth. Now, don't hear me wrongly. (laughs) I'm not saying that Jesus didn't achieve your salvation. But that's the consequence of his main mission. That's riding on the coattails of his revelation. Because as soon as we say the forgiveness of my sins is at the centre, who is suddenly at the centre of Jesus? Not God, but me. Not the significance of God, but my significance. But no, the the central truth remains in the mind of Christ. He expressed his godness to show the significance of God. This is what made Calvin tick. It made Calvin tick because personally it softened his own heart. I know what it's like to be a young man who thinks he can conquer the world. And Calvin could conquer the world. And God softened his heart and showed him who was the most significant. Second, it helped Calvin understand what was going on in the church around him. You see, the church around him had replaced the glory of God with the glory of man, the glory of humanity. And so instead of God being at the centre, who's at the centre? God. Luther broke the door down. Calvin helped establish the foundation that the people of God are about the glory of God. And thirdly, you can't say this enough, I think Calvin was captivated by the glory of God. It dominated everything he did. It grabbed his heart and his hands and his feet and his life. And so it structured everything he did. And and Calvin then understood what his daily work was going to be about. If that's the glory of God, where's it revealed most completely in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus? And where do I know that most fully? In the word of God alone. So the glory of God displayed in Christ alone, revealed in the word of God alone. And so Calvin was a proclaimer, a preacher. And he just worked. Do you notice what we've just done? We've just gone verse by verse. That's what Calvin did. Verse by verse. Verse by verse. In such a way, let me read a quote. On Easter Day, 1538, after preaching, Calvin left the pulpit, banished by the city council. He returned in September 1541, over three years later, climbed into the pulpit and picked up his sermon in the very next verse. Remember where I was? Been away for three years, but this is where we are. And off he went. So that's what made him tick. That was his heartbeat. What was his work ethic? Well, turn with me to Luke 17 very quickly, and we'll rip through this one. Luke chapter 17, grab your Bibles, make it open there on page 930. Luke 17. This is a biography of Jesus, Luke 17, verse 5, page 930. And the disciples have come to Jesus. They ask him the question our world asks all the time. Isn't it a relevant question for our world? Make my faith big. You know one of the mantras of our world? You've just got to have faith. And so these guys come to Jesus and say, Jesus, make it big. And Jesus gently says, actually, it's not about how big your faith is. If you've got faith this big, what can you do? Amazing things. The key issue is not so much how big your faith is, but where your faith is. 
It's not so much how big your faith is, it's where your faith is. And if the object of your faith is sufficient to trust in, then the object of your faith is in charge of your life. The one you trust in is the one you depend upon and he is the one who rules your life. And for God's mob, that's who? That's God and his son, Jesus. And then Jesus unpacks what that looks like. He, the image he uses is a master and a servant, an employer and employee. And the essence of what Jesus is saying, that is, if we trust in God through Jesus Christ alone, then we obey. No questions. You don't serve God because you need positive affirmation, you lack self-esteem, you need to feel relevant or significant. You don't serve God because you need direction in life and it's sadly lacking. You serve God because he is worth trusting in and that means he runs your life. And do you notice what it means you're not looking for in verse 9? You're not looking for a compliment or an affirmation. Just do your job. Just do your job. And Calvin embodied that. He embodied that in the motel room when Pharrell shirt fronted him. He embodied that when he turned his back on the happiest three years of his life and came back to Geneva. He embodied that as he spent 14 years of combat and opposition and meeting dogs named Calvin. He embodied that when his dear, beloved Idolette died after nine years. He embodied that when he had to make a decision to preach on, well, what will I preach on the next verse? Because it's not about me, it's about God. Calvin's heartbeat was the glory of God displayed in Christ and revealed in the word of God. And the work ethic was obedience, obedience. But the last point on the outline, uh, why do we do this? We do this so that we shine a light from God through his people in another generation. So here are three lessons to learn. Calvin's heartbeat was the glory of God, displayed in Christ most fully, revealed in God's word alone. It captured every aspect of his life. What glory entrances us? What glory has captivated us? What glory takes all of our desires, decisions, aims, aspirations, hopes, future, labour, our present? What glory grabs us? Uh, in the middle of the University of Geneva is a massive 100 metre long display of more than 20 figures from the Reformation, each more than four metres tall. Uh, in the middle of that display is Calvin. to remember the Reformation. Less than 3% of Switzerland believe in Jesus. Wouldn't it be terrible if we avoided the question of the glory that grabbed us and the statues that we erect show that we've drifted? All of life is captured by the glory of God. It's all-encompassing. It grasps everything because the lordship of Jesus affects everything. For Calvin, that was never hypothetical. It was always practical. Within the city of Geneva was a bunch of small, very successful, upwardly mobile business people who were called the Libertines. The Libertines insisted that they were members of Calvin's congregation and were welcome to the Lord's Supper, but they also insisted that from Monday to Saturday they could do what they wanted. They turned up to church after Calvin had warned them and they insisted on receiving the Lord's Supper. Calvin protected the bread and wine with his body as they beat him. You cannot say that Jesus is your Lord and Saviour and not let him have everything. The glory of God grabs everything, everything. 
and leaves nothing unturned. Thirdly, Calvin gathered in order to go. Calvin wanted the glory of God known everywhere. He wanted the word of God proclaimed everywhere so people could meet Christ everywhere. That's really what the word Catholic means. It's for everyone. And so all of those refugees came, those 7,000 refugees who wanted their lives safe, and he educated them, and then he sent them out again. And most of them died. In fact, from Geneva, the first evangelical missionaries ended up in Brazil by the end of Calvin's life. It's appropriate we did the mission spot today, isn't it? Do we gather to go? Or do we gather to huddle? Do we gather to go or do we gather to huddle? Where will we go today? Narrabri, New South Wales, rural Australia, perhaps overseas, so the glory of God is known? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for Calvin. Thanks for your goodness. Thanks for confronting us. Thanks for the glory you reveal in Jesus. Help us to be entranced and captivated by it. Amen.